Thank you, John. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Ornstein. I'm a member of the Class Day Committee, a proud member of Section E, and the HPS Class of 2010. Sir Ronald Cohen, our Class Day speaker, began his post-HPS career as many in our class will. Following his graduation from Harvard Business School, he joined McKinsey and Company as a consultant in London. But his instincts to embark on a new and entrepreneurial venture soon led him in a different direction. He teamed up with three Harvard colleagues in 1972 to launch multinational management group in London, Paris, and Chicago. A few years later, this would become Apex Partners. Sir Ronald was one of Europe's first venture capitalists, investing in businesses that traditional banks were reluctant to finance. His involvement in venture capital commenced at a particularly difficult time, just as a global recession took hold and long before the UK and Europe embarked on important economic reforms. Yet, when he steps down from the chairmanship 33 years later, Apex was the largest Europe-based global private equity firm with an impressive investment record, over 20 billion under management, offices in eight countries, and over 300 staff. Sir Ronald's perseverance helped finance hundreds of businesses and laid the foundation for the growth of the venture capital industry in Europe. But his contributions to society extend beyond that. He opted to step down as Apex's chairman to devote all his time to improving the lives of the disadvantaged in Britain and the Middle East. In 2002, he co-founded and chaired Bridges Community Ventures, a community development venture fund for investments in England's poorest areas that uses entrepreneurship to fight poverty. Sir Ronald helped create and fund the Portland Trust to alleviate poverty and ease tensions in the Middle East through economic means. In the UK, Sir Ronald chairs a British government task force and charitable sector commission that seeks to create a social investment bank that would channel unclaimed assets in British banks and other financial institutions, estimated to be about 500 million pounds into social investment. He has been a consultant, an entrepreneur, a manager, and an investor. He is the author of The Second Bounce of the Ball, Turning Risk into Opportunity, about entrepreneurship. He was founder and former vice chairman of NASDAQ Europe, a founder, director, and past chairman of the British Venture Capital Association, and a founder, director of the European Venture Capital Association. Sir Ronald is a graduate of Oxford University, where he was president of the Oxford Union. He's an honorary fellow of Exeter College, Oxford, and has an MBA from this institution to which he was awarded a Henry Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Sir Ronald Cohen. Thank you very much, uh, Todd. Um, thank you all for turning up on such a warm day and giving me such a warm welcome. I know of only one other person in Cambridge who has received a warmer welcome and that's the gentleman sitting in the, middle of, in the middle of the space over here. I've come to the conclusion you must be British because your total disregard for the weather and your ability to get on with your life despite it smacks of that. <laughs> it, it really is a privilege uh, for me to be here for several reasons. Uh, the first is, of course, to celebrate with all of you your graduation from Harvard Business School. I well remember that moment, although it was rather less grand than it is uh, today. In 1969, at the age of uh, 24, uh, when I found myself as uh, highly trained as all of you are, and wondering what uh, the next uh, 30, 40 years would bring. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm also delighted, though, to thank from this podium Jay Light for his leadership at the business school over the past five years, stepping in at a moment's notice and doing just the most incredible job. We all owe you a lot, Jay. Thank you. Uh, 
And I would also like to extend my warmest wishes to Nitin Noria, who takes over as the new dean of this uh, tremendous institution. You don't realize please thank you, how much work and effort goes into leading an institution that stands as the uppermost institution in its field across uh, the world. And uh, Nitin, we are lucky to have you picking up the baton from uh, Jay, uh, and we know that you will run just as fast as your predecessors have and win the relay race. But I'd like to take you all back for a moment to what is in the air. What do you feel is in the air apart from the torrid heat? Because when I was here at the age of uh, 22, I came straight from Oxford to the business school. You could do that in those days. Something was in the air. And something is in the air today and it's a different thing. And what was in the air then first captured my attention because General Dorio, who had uh, taught at the business school, invested $70,000 in a computer company called DEC. And while I was here in uh, 1968, that company floated and General Dorio collected $350 million for his $70,000 investment. That caught my attention, as you might expect. Those were the days of the big corporations. The coveted jobs were with General Motors and Chrysler, with US Steel, which was then the 10th largest company in the United States. Today, I think it's about number 200. With the Eastman Kodak, which was about uh, number 30 in the States, and today is number 300. And over the two years that I was here, I, together with the three partners that uh, I met uh, here, came to the conclusion that the ball was bouncing in a very interesting place. The ball of entrepreneurship, of high-tech entrepreneurship, was bouncing. And it would land, we thought, in an area that would provide us with a very great opportunity. Just as the ball that is bouncing now, to which I will refer, provides all of you with a massive opportunity. And nobody then could have guessed that it would take only about 15 years for Intel to go public and Microsoft and Sun and Oracle and Cisco. And only 10 years after that for those companies to make it to the top 100 companies in the world. Now that was something new. And it was the world of entrepreneurship. People didn't know how to spell entrepreneur in Europe, although it's a French word. Let alone venture capitalist. I can tell you a true story that a friend of mine in the venture capital business took his kid to visit the headmaster of his school in Britain. And the headmaster asked the child, who must have been 10 or 11, what does your father do? And he said, oh, my father is an adventure copulist. <laughs> that was the state of the venture capital industry. People couldn't spell entrepreneur, and they didn't understand what venture capitalists do. Today, this world of entrepreneurship has transformed our economies, not just here in the United States, not just throughout Europe, but throughout the whole world. There's no longer a question about whether it is more prestigious to run your own company than to work for a large one. The talented athletes in terms of business are prepared to take on the biggest challenge which is to create a company because there's a whole formal industry supporting you in doing that and because at the end of the day the greatest challenge brings the greatest prize. And the first insight I would like to give you is that the world runs away from risk. The world runs away from risk because it's an emotive word which comes from Italian. And rischiare in Italian means running into danger. 
So if I ask any of you, do you want to take a risk? Of course, the answer is going to be no. But this emotive word masks the value of something very valuable for each and every one of you. And that is the value of uncertainty. Certain things don't bring the prospect of great success or great profit. Only uncertain things do. And the ability and the tools that you have acquired here to be able to foresee what is about to happen and to put yourself into a position to take advantage of it is perhaps your greatest asset. Risk in that sense, uncertainty, is your friend. You know not to run away from it. You know that the trick is to exploit it. And the second thing you're going to find out is that everything is trial and error. It's liberating. It was liberating for me to understand that the race is not always to the swift, that however good you are, you may fail because not everything is under our control. But that the trick of the entrepreneur, whether he be an entrepreneur in his or her company or an entrepreneur in one of the largest corporations, is to turn unavoidable setbacks to advantage every time. If you manage to do that, you win the respect of your teams, you create credibility for everything that you do. And the third thing is that principles have a cost. I can't tell you how many times around the APAX table we would consider an investment and there were things about it that I didn't like particularly. And the arguments would be, well, if we don't do this, think of our competitor who's going to do that. It's a debt collection business with a doubtful reputation. These guys will get ahead, they'll get a higher IRR, and they will raise a bigger fund than we will. And the answer is no. Just understand that when you do something out of principle, there's always a cost to it. But it's always a bargain in the end. The track record for principled companies and principled management is a hell of a lot better than that of corrupt companies. Now, as I began to build the private equity industry in Europe in order to create room for our firm to thrive, I began to get involved increasingly with policy makers. And what you don't realize yet is that the tools that you have acquired here enable you to do almost anything in the field of management, in the field of entrepreneurship, or in the field of government. There isn't a group of 900 people that I would rather lead to do the most difficult thing. And I was very proud of the record of the venture capital industry and of the number of millionaires that we had helped to create. But I began to realize something, which is that as economies grow faster and faster, as tax rates are brought down to provide greater and greater incentive for effort and imagination and creativity, so the gap between rich and poor instead of lessening as the standard of living rises, actually increases. And there was something disturbing about that for me. And when the Treasury in 2000 called me up and said, look, would you look at the problems of poverty in Britain? Because we just don't understand how government can solve them. Government is unable to reduce these gaps. We don't want to do it through taxation and redistribution and reduce the incentives. But the social tensions that are going to arise if we allow this gap to increase are going to be unbearable. And as uh, uh, Todd, I think, uh, said in his introduction, I accepted the leadership of the Social Investment Task Force. And I'd like to give you some of the insights that I've acquired. And that is what's in the air today. That's what I feel when I'm here at the B-School with 20% of you following social enterprise courses and with comments such as those you have heard from your fellow students. 
The reality is that our brains and skills have never been applied with the same consistency, the same intensity of effort, the same focus to dealing with social issues as they have been in building companies. And the reality is that those very same skills are capable of transforming social issues. And whereas the actions of government create dependency, the actions of a not-for-profit sector or of a for-profit sector focused on social issues and resolving them create independence. And I'll give you one image only from Bridges Ventures. Bridges Ventures started from scratch in 2002, now has 150 million pounds, about a quarter of a billion dollars under management. We wanted to prove that if we invested only in the poorest 25% of Britain, we could deliver results that were half as good as the venture industry, 10 to 12%. The government put 20 million pounds in the fund, we raised 20 million pounds. Do you know who is the most powerful role model created? The most powerful role model created as an entrepreneur that we've backed is a single mother of three who left school at 16 with one GCSE and with her business partner turned 300,000 pounds into 22 million pounds in three years. And I'll tell you afterwards what she did. She'd worked in a call center and she adapted it. And we can, we can talk about that. People don't want charity. They want a chance. If you can provide capital to areas that are starved of it, the levels of motivation are higher than they are in the mainstream of economy. And the fact that they are not formally trained, entrepreneurs are not formally trained in the way that we are here, is more than compensated for by the obstacles they've learned to surmount and their ability to survive. Bridges is one example that each of you could have come up with and implemented. It's doing good at the same time as doing well. But if you look at has Bridges been followed by umpteen other social venture firms, the answer is no, not yet. And part of the reason is that just like the venture capital and private equity industry before, we need to create a system to support social investment, to turn social investment into an asset class. That system, in, in a world where social return does not attract capital in the way that financial return does, requires the creation of a social investment bank. And when we first came up with this idea four or five years ago in Britain, people were a bit skeptical. Then the government allocated 75 million pounds, 120 million dollars of equity to it. We wanted uh, three, four times that. And we created it anyway. It's in the basement of 42 Portland Place. And a dozen people, similar to each and every single one of you, less well qualified, because they haven't all been to the B-School, although some have, sat around the table and said, how are we going to invent some new financial instruments to deal with issues that government fails to tackle? And we alighted on the issue of young prisoners who reoffend. Do you know that prisoners under the age of 21 who are imprisoned for less than one year have a 92% probability of reoffending within two years? 92% of those released from prison at or before the age of 21 reoffend within two years. So we came up with a social impact bond. We raise the capital, we go to the government, and we ask the government to pay on results. If we reduce the rate of reoffending, we can receive between 7 and 13% yield and repay the bond over a period of seven years. Do you know how much money is in microfinance funds now, which is what, 20, 30 years old? $39 billion. There's no reason why we can't get social impact bonds. 
to that level. Because governments are cash constrained, understand the limits to what they do, and are beginning to understand, and it is this which is in the air now, that you can only get capitalist society to operate in a way that is going to cope with its social tensions if you create a powerful and well-funded social sector of not-for-profits and for-profits which are focused on a social goal, connected to the capital markets, attracting people such as each and every one of you to manage them in order to achieve scale and sustainability. When the penny drops or the cent drops on this crisis, that is going to be one of the conclusions. And so my message to you as you leave the business school is have confidence in yourself. You can't learn to swim by doing exercises on the beach. I'm sure you're very tempted to dive in just now. But you have to get started. You're able to start. Remember that trial and error is part and parcel of being an entrepreneur. Aim high and persevere and you will make it. Good luck and Godspeed. Sir Ronald, thank you again. I hope this day has provided an opportunity to celebrate, reflect, inspire, and look forward to the adventures and opportunities ahead. A sincere thank you to my colleagues on the Class Day Committee, Jamie Chang, Anjali Vedia, Sophie Gassi, and to Kelly Diamond, without whose help this day would not have been possible to HBS Operations for turning Baker Lawn into this beautiful spot that we find ourselves in right now. Thank you to the administration and to the faculty, and most importantly, to the family and friends of the HBS class of 2010. Congratulations.